Hey, everybody. How's it? Good? Cool. Thanks. Appreciate you. It's really amazing. Starting off the year right. Feeling really good. Confident. Excited. Like everybody else in this room right now. You guys weren't even here at 8 o'clock. Like, why are you? I don't understand. They have a reason to be kind of like, you know, whatever. It's so early. Hey, uh, can I just acknowledge as we start that it's the year 2022? Well, don't woo yet. Which is also pronounced 2022. As in 2020 also. 2020 again. I, man, it's been a rough couple of years, like roller coaster, up and down. Amazing, horrifying, amazing, horrifying. Like there's been no like middle ground at all in the last couple of years. And I'm really hopeful that at least I personally have grown enough in the last couple of years that if we do experience 2020 again, I won't fall to pieces as much as I did before. And hopefully the same for you. Um, hopefully we've grown. I can't make any promises though. Uh, and that's because uh, as people, we love to make resolutions. We love it. Every year, people make resolutions at this time of year. In fact, uh, current surveys are saying that 41% of people in America are still making resolutions every New Year's. They're still making a resolution on New Year's. Resolutions like get in shape, eat healthy, cut down on my screen time, make more money, get a promotion, buy a house, find a spouse, or maybe just a boyfriend or a girlfriend. These are all resolutions that people are saying, yeah, I'm making that resolution this year. But can I tell you, there is a stat that is brutal. Only 9% of people who made these resolutions at the end of the year felt successful. That doesn't even mean they actually were successful. That just means they felt like they were successful. Right? And I know at least for me, like sometimes I can convince myself I've been successful when I haven't. I'm going to make a resolution this year. I'm going to lose 30 pounds. And if I lose five, I'm going to feel successful. I did it. I did it. So 41% of people, they're saying, I'm going to make a resolution this year to better myself, but only 9% of them at the end of the year actually feel successful. And can I tell you, I hate resolutions. I hate them. I hate New Year's resolutions. I hate most kinds of resolutions because the fact about resolutions is this. They make me feel bad about myself. When I wake up in the morning and I'm like, resolution, going to get in shape, going to go ride the bike, and I don't do it, guess who feels bad? Me. Not the resolution. The resolution doesn't feel bad about it. The resolution is constant. I'm the one who feels bad. I'm the one who feels like a loser. Like, again, I've not done it. And starting in high school, I started making resolutions. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to accomplish all this stuff in my life. And guess what? I didn't do any of it. Not a single time in my life did I keep a resolution. In fact, the only resolution I've ever kept in my life is to not drink soda. And I've gone six years right now. And I'm feeling pretty good about it. But guess what? I still go in the grocery store and want a Coke. So pray for me. That's what we're going to pray about on Tuesday if you come. So if we're so bad at keeping resolutions, why do we do it? Why do we constantly go back to making resolutions every single year when we're so bad at keeping them? Well, I think it's a simple truth about us as people. We crave two things, fulfillment and progress. We crave fulfillment and progress. We want the graph to go up and onwards. And we'll, we'll take fulfillment and progress at any cost. Like, think about how you're getting your daily dose of dopamine right now. It's probably from looking at a screen that when you put it down, you actually feel bad about. And think about the progress that we're trying to make. That same screen that I roll over and look at every single morning is the same screen that research shows is damaging to your brain. But it's in my pocket right now. And probably the first thing that I do when I walk off the stage is pull it out and look at it. So we want progress and fulfillment no matter what it costs us. And it all started with Adam and Eve. Think about their situation. It was perfect. They were in this garden. God was there. They met with him every day. They didn't fight Think about that. The first married couple didn't fight. Spectacular. But they felt like they needed something more. And they were convinced by a serpent in that same garden that they could be more fulfilled 
and that they could make more progress if they had the knowledge of good and evil like God. And so they ate the fruit, and here we are. No different than them. We haven't come very far from that day in the garden. We're still in the same pattern. Gotta get more, gotta get fulfilled, gotta make progress, but it's never enough. It's never enough. So what's the deal with that? How can we wrap our heads around that? How can we make sense of that? Why is this the case? Everyone wants fulfillment, but we can't get it. Everyone wants progress, but we can't get it. Well, the truth is we're all sinners. We are all subject to a condition that we are born into. That is, we are born into this world sinners. If you got a Bible today and you want to open it up, we're going to go to Romans chapter 3. If you don't have one, the verses will be on the screen for you. Romans chapter 3, Paul is going to paint this picture of humanity. And it is honestly pretty tough. So... We're going to read verses 9 through 18, and I just want you to think not about other people, but about yourself. I'm going to think about myself right now. Verse 9, it says this, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. So Paul starts right off the bat. He's like, here's the premise. It doesn't matter where you were born, where you're from, who your parents are, what your family tree is, every single one of us is born under sin, subject to sin. Verse 10, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood and their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's kind of devastating. That's kind of messed up. Like that takes the idea of us as sinners and really takes it to another level, doesn't it? None of us is good. None of us does right. Our paths are full of ruin and misery and destruction. There's venom on our tongues. And I think sometimes it's really easy to be like, well, that's really talking about the bad people, right? Like that's talking about the people who really, really are bad. Like they get up in the morning and they want to be bad. That's not really about me. But the fact is we are all born under this same sin. And if I'm honest with myself and I look back at the week that I've had, even though it's been a pretty good one, so many of these characteristics mark my life when I walk away from God. When I have an angry tongue, when I'm bitter about a situation, when I don't have peace and I don't seek after God, I am falling into a habit and a pattern of living that is Romans chapter three. And it's the same condition we're all born into. We all start here at birth. This is the starting line for life. We are all incapable of doing what is right for the right reasons. That's pretty messed up. And on a New Year's sermon, this is usually the point where the pastor will say, so, three things you can do to live a fulfilled year. Has anybody heard that sermon before? Nobody. Okay, I'm the only one who grew up Baptist, I guess. I heard this sermon a hundred times in my life. Dad, no offense. There are three things you can do right now that are going to lead you to a more fulfilling life. Let me give them to you. Tell me if you heard this before. Read your Bible, pray, go to church. Anybody? Yeah. See that hand. Thank you. Those are the three things, right? How often have we said that to other people? Right? Life is going sideways for you. Have you been reading your Bible? Have you prayed about it? Did you go to church? How many times do I say that to myself? Well, the reason things aren't going well is because you only read your Bible twice this week, so obviously the other five days you were just being Romans 3. I heard this entire, my entire life. My whole life growing up, sermon after sermon, Sunday school lesson after Sunday school lesson, times in Awana, Read your Bible, pray, go to church. Guess what? I ran wild most of my life. It didn't impact me. It didn't change me. And even now, if I'm being completely honest with you, which I 
basically always will be. Sometimes I read my Bible and pray and go to church like I'm supposed to for weeks on end, but I don't feel fulfilled. I don't feel like I'm making progress. I turn around and I'm the same person I've always been. And that can be hurtful to me because I'm like, dude, I'm doing it right. I'm doing the things. But here's the truth. Making your list, yourself a list of chores to be a better Christian is like making a law for yourself to live by. Just having a list of chores that you do, and if you check the box every day, everything is going to be perfect, and you're going to be the person you're supposed to be, and life is never going to go sideways. It's just not true. That's what the law was. God said, if you can keep all these commandments, you're good to go. Well, guess what? The whole point was we can't. The whole point of Romans 3 is that we cannot keep the law. We can't do it. We always fall short. But the truth of the matter is this. We don't live under law. We live under grace. And if we exclusively live by habits and to-do lists and checklists, we will not find grace. It's not going to happen. We'll instead find routines and obligations. And routines and obligations don't lead you to a fulfilling life. They lead you to bitterness and anger. They lead you to walk away from what you've been doing and try something new. They leave you feeling empty like you need something else. And here's part of the problem. So much of what especially the American church has told us to do our whole lives is completely focused around our left brain, the left half of our brain. And you guys have probably heard this before, left brain versus right brain. And the left side of the brain is all about this language and words, logic, linear thinking, just being straight ahead, facts. And can I tell you, we need this half of our brain. We need this half of our brain to be able to understand God's word, to be able to know the facts that are in there, to understand the truth that's in there. But can I tell you, if we only use the left half of our brain, we're leaving half of our potential untapped. We need the right side of our brain, the existence of joy and relationship in order to find real and lasting development, fulfillment, and progress in our lives. You see, the right side of your brain is where your feelings live and holistic thinking and the rhythm of life and intuition. And we can spend infinite amounts of time learning facts and theology, and we can spend very little time developing relationships that produce joy. So this year, instead of telling you to build habits into your life, which are good habits, habits that will benefit you, but they're habits you already know to do, so instead of telling you yet again this year, build these habits, I'm going to ask you to do something different. This year, I'm going to ask you to build three relationships, three relationships to build this year. And the first one is this, build your relationship to Jesus. So here's the thing. We read Romans chapter three. It told us how messed up we are. It told us how bad we are. It told us that we don't seek God. In fact, we seek the opposite. We seek death. But God, in spite of that, loved us enough to send his son Jesus to the earth that through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can be saved. And that is a 100% fact and something that I put my faith in. And it is in that salvation that my sin problem gets dealt with, a sin problem I couldn't deal with myself. We can be forgiven and we can be made into a new creation when we give our lives to Jesus, when we receive his forgiveness. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. You see, when you give your life to Jesus, we know this as a fact, right? As a fact, we know we are forgiven. As a fact, we know we're going to heaven. We can rely on that fact, that truth, that Jesus Christ is the only way. However, we also need to understand that we now have an ability to love Jesus and to experience his love back in return. That wasn't the case before. Before salvation, we couldn't fully understand the love of God. And now we are in Jesus. We are identified in him. We are part of his family. We are in his kingdom. And we are a new creation. We are a new person. And so what we can do 
because of love for Jesus and because of Jesus' love for us is we can start to see Jesus teaching differently. We can read about the life of Jesus and start to see the way that he loved and had compassion and concern for other people. And we can know that that's the exact way that he feels towards us. I don't know about you, but I grew up in a place where when I read the Bible, I read that God was angry all the time or that God was frustrated or that God was disappointed. And I felt like no matter what I did, God wouldn't be happy. And to an extent that's true because my good works could never amount to anything before God. But what I do know is this, on the other side of salvation, I can see that God loves us deeply. I can see that God has compassion for us at every turn. I can see that Jesus is empathetic to us, that he understands what we're going through. And as I start to see that when I read the scripture, it can change my heart, my feelings of how I feel God looks at me and how I look back at God. And we can also remember what Jesus has done for us, keeping that at the forefront of our thinking. When things aren't going well, when it feels tough, to just remember, no matter what today brings, Jesus still died for me. Jesus still loved me enough that he came to lay down his life on my behalf. So first we have to build our relationship to Jesus. Second, build your relationship to your identity. Identity is such a big thing like in our country and our culture right now. We want so deeply for people to really know who we are. We don't want people to misunderstand who we are or what we're about. And I think there's part of that that's good. We should be working to understand each other, to know each other truly. But here's the other thing about identity. Identity can be messed up. Identity can go the wrong direction, and identity can be all the things that you don't like about yourself, all the things that you struggle with. But see, when Jesus saved us and we became a new creation in Jesus, our identity changed forever. We were lost, and now we're saved. We owed a sin debt we couldn't pay, and now we've been reconciled. We once were worthless, but now we're gifted. The old is gone, the new has come. We were under under condemnation, now we're forgiven. We were once without a family, and now we are adopted. We once had lives full of hatred, and now they are full of love. We once were defeated, and now we're victorious. You see, God's word tells us that all these things are true of who we are as people. It's not just true of us as a church. It's true of each individual who's given their life to Jesus. And I have this tendency to think the worst of myself. I have this tendency to think of myself in regards to Romans chapter three instead of to my true identity. When I make a mistake, I tend to ruminate and dwell on it and hold it close to me. And I'm working through why that is. There's a lot of reasons. But I have to know that God saved me through Jesus to be more than my human limitations. God saved me through Jesus so I could live beyond the limitations of sin. And we must always remember that this isn't through our own strength, but instead is through the helper that Jesus has given us, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit now lives in us, and that means that God is close at all times. God is always present with us. It's a close relationship. He's not far away. He's right here, right now. And as we go through our day and we're challenged by who we used to be, We need to know and understand and ask the Holy Spirit for help to challenge what we say about ourselves that's false and replace it with what God says about us. And to know that each one of these things that God says about us is also a way that he thinks about us. God thinks of us as being saved, as being reconciled. God thinks of us as being gifted. God thinks of us as a new person who's forgiven and adopted and loved and victorious. That's not angry. That's not disappointed. God loves us. And God wants us to know how loved we are by telling us what our true identity is. So we must build our relationship to Jesus, to our identity, and finally build your relationship to other believers. This is a big one for me. Um, If any of you have been around when I've taught in the last, uh, in the Wednesday nights or at Battle Plan, this is like my favorite verse It always seems to make it into every sermon I preach. 
This verse has changed my life over and over and over again. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is an awesome verse. I love this verse. There are so many verses that I wish I could memorize, but like this is one of the ones that I actually have memorized that I recite to myself. Because you see, starting with Adam and Eve, the intention was always for us to live in relationship. That was always the intention of humanity, to live in relationship, to be in relationship. And can I tell you, that's what Hebrews 10 right here is talking about. It's talking about a lifestyle of relationship. And this is not a lobby relationship. If I'm being totally honest with you, there are a lot of you that I recognize your face, and I'll be honest, I don't know your name. I'm so sorry. I just don't. But we say hi to each other, and we greet each other in the lobby, and I'm honestly happy to see you. I'm genuinely happy to see you, but we don't have a relationship. We're acquaintances. That's okay. But if all I have is acquaintance in my life, guess what? My life's never going to change in the long term. There's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. It doesn't work. It can't happen. So this year, who are you deeply and profoundly honest with? Who's the person that if you got up on the stage right now would text you later and say that outfit needs to go? That's the kind of relationship that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of relationship where that person is deeply committed to honesty with you because they love you that much. They love you enough to be honest even when it might cost them something. And can I tell you too, who are you pursuing that you could be that person in their life? See, relationship is a two-way street. It's not just about somebody who's gonna keep it real with you. It's also about somebody that you're gonna keep it real with. I spent so much of my life in fake relationships, shallow, worthless, and they always ended with me just walking away, just walking away and just not being part of it anymore. The number of people in my life that I've left in my wake who I just completely ghosted in life, I had the same best friend from fifth grade through high school, and I just quit talking to him. Because I wasn't committed to having a profound and real relationship with that person. You need to find a person. And can I tell you, don't let it be your spouse. Find, if you're a guy, you find another guy. They don't have to be the same age as you. They don't have to be in the same stage of life as you. If you have kids and they don't, it doesn't matter. And if you're a woman, find another woman. Don't make it be your spouse. Don't do that to your spouse. Find somebody that you are going to be deeply and profoundly honest with at all times. And for some of you, that might start with getting in a small group. If you're not already in one, you need to be in one. Can I tell you, that is the conviction of my heart today. I'm not in one. I'm not. And it's hurting me. And it's making my life harder. If you're not in a group, you got to be in one. That's where this starts. If you're already in a group, pick somebody that you feel comfortable with and pursue a relationship of honesty with them. And it's gonna be scary and it's gonna take vulnerability and you're gonna have to take a step of faith and hope that they don't look at you like you're crazy. But when you find that connection and you find that relationship, I guarantee you, no matter how close you are in proximity, you will still be close to that person. They will still be there for you no matter what. You see, so many of us, myself included, have worked so diligently to build habits that we hope will make us better Christians. We have worked so hard to just check the list in such a way that we'll become more like Jesus. But can I tell you, without the relational component we will never see long-lasting life change like we want. 
if you miss the relational component, the relationship to Jesus and to your identity and to other believers, the Bible reading will just amount to knowledge, not life change. Today, we're going we're gonna to baptize some people. Yeah. I'm so excited for it. <laughs> My son's going to get baptized today. So you have to bear with me. <laughs> Baptism is an outward demonstration of an inward condition. Each person getting baptized today represents a life changed by the power of Jesus. A person born into sin who is now living a new life as a new creation because Jesus died in their place. And when they come and they get baptized, they're demonstrating relationship. They're demonstrating that they have a relationship to Jesus. They go under the water and they come back out to declare that Jesus is their Lord and Savior and that they're following after him with their life. They go under and come back up and they're saying, I'm not who I used to be. I am now who God says I am through Jesus. And they go under the water and they come back out and they say, I want you all to know that I'm going to encourage you and I need you to encourage me to be the person God wants me to be. And as they come right now and the band's going to come and play a song, I just want you to take a minute for yourself and think about what relationship do you need to focus on today? I bet there's a lot of you who have been reading your Bible and been praying and been coming to church. That's awesome. But what relationship needs work this year so that you can see real progress and real change that's long lasting in your life? Is it your relationship to Jesus? If you came today and you don't know him, it's really simple. Romans 3 says we're all sinners, but Romans also tells us that Jesus died in our place to forgive us of our sins. And if we put our faith in him, we can be saved. And he wants to love you and care for you and have empathy and compassion for you. Maybe it's your relationship to your identity. Do you actually believe you are who God says you are? Are you asking the Holy Spirit to help you internalize your identity in Jesus? Maybe for others, it's your relationship to other believers. Do you have somebody who really knows you? Do you have somebody that you are totally honest with, that you can have accountability with? I think it would be safe to say that all of us wanna have a year of progress. All of us wanna have a year of change for the better. And I just pray that we would have the strength to pursue these relationships in such a way that we could see it. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you so much for today. God, I thank you for loving us enough to send Jesus to die for us. I thank you that we can be forgiven by Jesus. God, I just pray now that, God, as we finish this service and these come to get baptized, that, God, we would consider the relationships that we need to work on in our life. Whether that's to Jesus, to our identity, or to other believers. I pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to take a step of faith to work on those relationships this year. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, New Hope, and Happy New Year uh, to all of you who have joined us both near and far in our digital community. We want you to know that we place a high value and a high priority on those of you who worship with us online. We know that for many people, for various reasons, are unable to join us in person. And so we strategically plan our Sunday worship services to make a maximum, maximum impact in your home and in your heart. So we thank you for joining us. And we pray that today God ministered to you through the ministry of his word and worship as a family. Well, I'm looking forward to being back with you next Sunday. 
as we go back to the book of Daniel. Finally, after all the holiday seasons, we're back to the book of Daniel for a great series. And the whole series is called Living in Babylon. And until next Sunday, I pray new hope that you will stand firm and courageous as you, as well as I, live in Babylon for the praise and glory of Jesus. Until then, I'm Craig Trueweather, your pastor, saying this, you are loved.